Hi there, this is Ann Griner, the President and CEO of the Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative. Thank you so much for joining our program this afternoon. We're going to be um, speaking with Dr. Carol Alter about behavioral health collaboration in primary care. And we're thrilled that you all have joined, um, and happy holidays to everyone. I know we're all um, working hard to get things off our desk um, before hopefully uh, taking a little time off to get um, refreshed with family and friends. Um, I wanted to let you know that early in 2018, in January, we're going to be issuing a calendar event of events for our members um, in 2018 so that you can see um, what's coming down the pike and can plan um, your time accordingly. But to let you know um, that our next webinar on January 30th we're going to have Dr. Evan Salino, who is a family physician at the Providence Southeast Family Medical Clinic in, um, or in Oregon. And he also um, has an affiliation with the Oregon Health Authority Patient Center Primary Care Program. Uh, Dr. Salino is going to talk to us about uh, Oregon's work um, to advance primary care through the primary care home, but also the recent legislation that was passed in July to put more investment into primary care. And um, it's very exciting, um, this new bill that will uh, require uh, all the payers in Oregon to increase what they are spending on primary care over a five-year period. And those additional funds will go into primary care alternative payment models. So I hope you're able to um, join our webinar on January 30th. Um, one housekeeping item, and I think it's also on our announcement slide, um, uh, the phone lines, um, in fact, will be um, uh, unmuted um, as we um, uh, get, get going with our program. You can always chat um, questions into the chat box, and um, please make sure that um, uh, you keep your um, phone on mute until you're ready to ask a question, because we certainly don't want to have any um, background noise. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Carol Alter, who is the um, Chief Medical Officer at Mindula. Um, she's a psychiatrist and has really spent her career focused on um, providing psychiatric care um, for patients who also have medical conditions. And she's um, really someone who works in many different domains. Um, clinical practice, as I just mentioned, and her research um, is related to um, care delivery and payment in innovative models. Um, uh, and also, um, she's um, uh, worked with the Institute of Medicine on a report, um, cancer care for the whole patient. So looking really not only at um, uh, the medical condition of folks who've, who have cancer, but also the whole patient is really about thinking about, um, you know, uh, the mental health issues and behavioral health issues that cancer patients uh, may also be dealing with. Um, Dr. Alter, um, so she's got clinical practice, um, focused on research and innovative models. Um, uh, another example of her work in terms of innovative models is working when she was a professor at Georgetown on the collaborative care program. And in that capacity, um, she had a project with Montgomery Care's safety net clinics, which served over 5,000 patients and was operational in five different clinics. Um, she uh, has been a leader in several national organizations, including the American Psychiatric Association, the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine, and the American Psychological Oncology Society. So um, it's a real treat to have Dr. Alter here today. One last thing about her background, uh, Dr. Alter has a medical degree from GW, so she knows Washington and did her psychiatric training at the Mayo Clinic, Cornell University, and also Memorial Sloan Kettering. So let me um, walt, uh, welcome Dr. Alter to the program and um, turn the baton over to you, Carol. Thanks, Anne. Uh, great to be here. Let's see if I can advance the slides properly. Oh, it's the first test. 
Yeah, so we, ah, there we go. So, um, so I'm I'm really thrilled thrilled to be here with you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, about integration of um, behavioral health into primary care. But first, I just wanted to explain to you um, what I was currently doing, and and um, just so you have some sense about Mindula Health, um, which I'm the chief medical officer of. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I I'm really um, sort of committed to the idea of um, scaling and being able to deliver um, evidence space practices and especially the collaborative care model or integration um, effectively into primary care. Um, Mindula Health is a very interesting um, new startup, uh, been around for a few years and what we're doing is we're um, scaling tech-enabled case and care managers um, using real live people, but using um, a number of um, technology innovations to be able to reach um, patients with behavioral health disorders. And, um, and by that, I mean both uh, 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 patients with serious mental illness, um, which we, address, we, we assist when they are transitioning from um, inpatient or some intensive psychiatric um, uh, service into the community, but also um, in collaborative care. And the way that we do that is we combine care management, um, care and case management, real life case and care managers um, with technology to really um, deliver an, a remote or a virtual um, intervention to patients. So they are assigned a real live person who interacts with them either um, through the web or through our, um, our secure messaging platforms um, um, and, um, um, over the phone or, or with through those platforms with the case or care manager um, again sort of wrapped within the the uh, primary care setting and we've got psychiatry to help us um, and we work um, we work to um, achieve better outcomes but I'm going to start from the beginning um, and talk a little bit again about um, integrated care um, and I, I think most of you on the phone um, have probably could could read this slide or at least could uh, could give could provide all of all of the detailed chapter and verse but I'll start there because I think it's really important to reiterate sort of the the ground the grounding of this and the PCC the PCPCC has been very involved in a lot of these issues over the years and so um, I think you know as members uh, you probably are aware that mental health problems um, affect one out of five Americans it's a very common problem and the majority of those folks will never seek help from a mental health specialist and I'm sure you've heard the oft used expression that the de facto mental health system is in primary care. And these disorders cause um, the, you know, cause significant disability world, worldwide. Um, the number of years, 10% of years lived with disability from depression alone in the total looking at disability. These are the most expensive patients, um, costing more than diabetes patients, more than heart disease, more than cancer. And in the US, there's one suicide every 14 minutes. And I haven't updated that sl this slide, so my guess is that number has actually increased. Um, the other thing is, if you look at the primary care side, the patients with, a mu with multiple medical comorbidities and high utilization of healthcare services are also those who have the highest rates or the higher rates of unrecognized and untreated um, mental health disorders. And when you address those behavior, uh, those behaviors and those um, syndromes, what you find is that 50% um, of all of, um, of the behavior determines 50% of all morbidity and mortality, that those unhealthy behaviors are major drivers of healthcare cost. Um, and, that, um, and that if you look at those patients with those comorbid conditions, 40 to 50% struggle with treatment adherence, which again can be addressed through uh, appropriate um, behavioral health interventions. These are also the most expensive patients. Um, this is data that was um, part of um, a study that was um, done by the Millman um, Group um, for the American Psychiatric Association. And, um, and it's important because, um, as you'll see, um, the the collaborative care model, which I'll talk a little bit about, is something that is um, now being reimbursed. And it was largely on, on the basis of this kind of data that CMS was really um, sort of had a call to action to be able to come up with a, a model and to reimburse a model of care. Um, what you can see is that in all cases, uh, commercial, Medicare, Medicaid, across all, um, that the um, that patients um, that have behavioral health as well as um, as physical uh, health diagnoses um, have an increase in their total costs. Um, 
um, up to 341% in Medicaid patients. So these are really, really expensive patients. And so obviously a group that we should be looking at. If you look at what happens currently, most of these patients don't get treatment um, from anybody. Um, about 20% will be treated by their primary care doc, and about 20% of them will be um, referred out to a behavioral health specialist, but you know, only 60% um, and but up but 60% get nothing at all. And um, if you think about it, um, part of this, you know, I think you all could tell me the reasons for this. And I think one of the biggest reasons is the sense that there aren't enough behavioral health um, specialists in the community, and that's true. Um, and the other piece of it is that even when, when patients are referred out, um, the majority of them don't um, actually follow up with those referrals. And when they do follow up with those, those referrals, they end up having one or two visits. So none of this really speaks to coming up with a really good solution. So there have been a lot of things that people have tried, and I think when you think about integration, when we think about integration, um, you know, I think the fantasy, and I've been doing a fair number of implementations of collaborative care in very large health systems um, in the last uh, few years, and I think that, um, you know, to a T, every single um, practice we walk into says, but just put a psychiatrist down the hall, or let's put a therapist down the hall, or, you know, if we did, if we had the social worker and the psychiatrist down the hall, then we would be just great. And I think that that is a, there's a lot to be said for that, for that model. I mean, the psychiatrist or the behavioral health specialist, you know, comes to the primary care setting. Um, there's opportunity for interaction and curbside consultations, which are really important. There is no, um, there is no under valuing of that. Um, and there can often be good integration and communication between that person and the, um, be, between the behavioral health specialist as well as the, and the primary care doc. And it's a, it's a solid bridge between um, primary care and physical health and, and mental health. But the issue on that is that the access is still problematic. Those, those new slots will fill up very quickly, so you end up having a waiting list very quickly. Um, there's often no shows, and there's little capacity for follow-up because there's often such a great demand um, for these services that you really can't you know, it's, it's, it feels unlimited after a while. Um, and there's limited um, ability to make sure the recommendations are carried out. So you're, if you're the provider, the mental health provider, and you're down the hall, you may see the patient, you'll send a note quickly, um, and then, you know, you won't have time to really follow up repeatedly with, to find out what's going on with the patient or really try to address, um, to address the many issues that often get in the way of um, effective uh, mental health treatment. And in many settings, um, that co-location is, um, is not available, although one could use telemedicine to, to, um, to do that. So it's, it's a good idea. And, it's, and, and in fact, um, while there, well, if you look at the, the data, you might say, you know, it's clear that there, there is not um, the same evidence base for this is some, for some other models. Um, I think the answer is it probably does work in the individual um, on the individual level for the patient who does get to see somebody. It's not a bad um, bad way to approach these kinds of problems. But if you're talking about trying to address an entire population, and when you're talking about so many patients within primary care needing services, this is not the best solution. Um, traditional consultation, I'm a consultation liaison psychiatrist, so I believe in um, the idea of consultation as being important. Um, I also think that having relationships with your um, other medical colleagues is important. Um, but I think that one of the things that we found is there just are never, will never be enough psychiatrists um, or other um, mental health specialists to really refer all patients for consultation. And when you add the need to do that within a network, um, it becomes increasingly difficult. Um, the, the other thing I think that we've heard, and you guys could probably tell me, is that primary care providers experience psychiatry um, kind of as a black box. They don't really understand what the patient's going to be doing with the psychiatrist. And even, um, even when the report comes back, it feels like it's not addressing necessarily the full, um, the full set of issues that are related to the comorbidities with, from the medical, uh, physical perspective. Um, that 
you know, you're going to get a full intake from a psychiatrist, which can be expensive or difficult to get if you're out of network. Um, and, um, and there may not be any time because of lack of reimbursement for a curbside consultation or um, really being able to have ongoing care. And, and again, one pass, it works best for a one time or an acute issue, but not so great for follow up. So what, where is the evidence? And the evidence has been with a model called collaborative care was developed um, primarily through the University of Washington, although lots of different people um, across the country participated in its early work and have participated since then. Um, but it's, um, but, but the University of Washington has a, a center which has been doing a lot of work at disseminating the model, addressing issues of access um, and reimbursement and, um, and also training. Um, and it's a specific type of integrated care that's built very closely to the chronic care model to improve access to evidence-based mental health treatments for primary care patients. And so like the chronic care model, it really, um, it really builds on a, a set of, of principles that it's team-based um, the idea being that you use a, a different a, a team of people, including a behavioral health care manager, a psychiatrist who collaborates and provides consultation, um, and um, who works within the primary care setting. It's evidence-based and so um, relies upon guideline-based care and measurement-based care um, to really drive the, um, the recommendations for intervention. Um, it's population-based in that um, the, the idea idea is that you do systematic screening and then patients who need something are put into the system and then you're able to really track their their progress over time and um and pay attention to those who need more uh, versus less um, thus getting to best outcomes and it's accountable meaning that you really can um, assure good outcomes and you can account for them in quality uh, measures and most third-party um, payers will um, will reimburse primary care practices that implement collaborative care in 2018. At least that's the uh, understanding. Right now, Medicare is paying for it. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So um, just to give you a little bit of background on the data, this is um, this is a sort of um, the information that came out of the impact study that was done um, now almost 15 years ago. It was published in JAMA. Um, over, I think, 1,200 patients involved, all of them over 65 in a number of clinical settings across the country. And they compared usual care to this collaborative care model. And um, the orange bars represent the patients who got impact impact and the blue bars are those who had usual care and there was a 50 percent or greater improvement in depression at 12 months um, and that was that was pretty um, compelling um, there have now been over 80 randomized controlled clinical trials in fact I think that last count the number was closer to um, 100 um, and there have been meta-analyses of collaborative care for depression and primary care using data from US and Europe um, and um, consistently this model um, has been more effective than usual care and since um, 2006, there have been additional um, randomized controlled trials in new populations, um, including anxiety and PTSD. And that's important because um, depression is not the only issue that, um, that impacts primary care. Um, anxiety is a very common one. And in the work that we've done in um, underserved areas, um, post-traumatic stress disorder is huge. Um, as well, there is evidence to support use in ADHD, alcohol, and substance use disorders. Um, the evidence base um, has been established, um, as I said, in a number of different areas, including adolescent depression um, and comorbid depression, diabetes and heart disease, depression and cancer, uh, depression in women's health care, also anxiety, PTSD, chronic pain and dementia. And um, as I said, there have been um, recent studies in substance use disorders and um, in bipolar disorder. And in fact, um, people are doing this to support the care of schizophrenic patients as well. So kind of what is the model um, to kind of give you some more depth on this? The traditional model is you've got the primary care um, doc who sees patients and then decides that they need to refer patients out. And um, there's one psychiatrist, and then what do you do with the rest of them? Um, so there's really a significant um, sort of lack of um, professionals out there. Um, and I would, and I would also venture to say that it's not the right um, intervention for all patients. That having a referral out is not qualitatively the right thing to do either, necessarily. 
So the new model basically says that you've got a PCP and they've got their patients, um, but now the PCP has a care manager um, who um, interacts with her and with her patients to um, identify um, what's going on and to um, to do a number of uh, validated rating scales and takes a history. And then um, she'll work directly with a psychiatrist, a consulting psychiatrist who does not see the patient, but here's the story, has the advantage of looking at the chart, the medical chart, um, and really puts the whole thing together in a set of recommendations to the primary care doc. You notice that there's a dotted line between the primary care doc and the psychiatrist, and that just that just is really there to say that the psychiatrist is there for curbsides if needed, but really the primary sort of source of information is the care manager and this very complete set of data, um, which um, you know allows the psychiatrist to make um, recommendations. So what, how does it actually work? And um, in the upper left-hand corner, um, you see a bunch of unhappy people. Um, those are the unhappy depressed patients or anxious patients. And, and what I want to basically call out here is that, again, this is a population-based um, intervention, and that's, that's important. Um, in the work that we've done, I, I just want to make one comment about this. Um, it's been very interesting, primary care docs, and I've been doing this for a long time, and I've done work around lots of different ways to try to address this issue with primary care docs, with having psychiatrists try to help train primary care docs, um, as if primary care docs don't know what they're doing. It's more about um, culture and time and so on and so forth. Um, so it kind of been there and done lots of different things. And I think one of the things that we found is that if you don't screen, uh, on average, a primary care doc will, number one, they say, I'm doing this, I'm doing, a, I'm doing a great job or not such a great job, but I just need a psychiatrist. But if you say, just refer us the patients that you need help with, you find that they refer somewhere between two and 4%. Consistently, we've seen this over and over again. But if you screen, what you find is that if you do universal screening with patients and you do it effectively with um, a self-report measure, um, and especially if you can target more than depression, but use depression and anxiety and other, um, other symptoms, what you'll find is that somewhere between 20 and 40% of patients will be identified. And if you give that information to the doc, what they do is they refer 20% of their patients. And that really fits with the epidemiology um, in the community. And I think that's about right. Um, so it's very interesting um, that, you know, again, the screening, the screening is worth doing and it's worth doing for a number of reasons, not just because, um, because it, it allows for kind of the, you know, getting all of the patients, but because it really helps with uh, quality measures and accountability programs as well. So patients are screened, that's the best way to go. And then you've got a care manager who could be a, a behavioral health care manager, who can be a nurse, could be a social worker, could be a counselor. They administer, they're trained in the model, they administer validated measures, they review the clinical information in the chart, um, and they complete an intake, they review it with a psychiatrist, um, and um, the psychiatrist provides uh, treatment recommendations, the primary care doc, and then those treatment recommendations are sent as a report, um, usually to the primary care doc, and they begin treatment with medications. Um, the care, collaborative care um, care manager will then um, make other um, help with other referrals that are needed. Um, in, in many cases, patients will be referred for psychotherapy um, or other support treatments that they might need, and they work with the patient and with the um, primary care practice to help make those referrals. Um, they monitor. They then monitor the progress. They repeat the me they repeat measures based on symptoms. They provide support to patients and provide updates to the primary care doc on additional um, changes that might be made needed. And on the left side, left bottom, maybe we should put lots of happy patients, but uh, their the patients improve and um, it improves outcomes. Um, and it and there is really significant evidence to show that it decreases utilization um, and improves costs and contributes to quality measurement and accountability. Let's see. Ah, okay, oops. Let's see if I can go back. Okay. Uh, Okay, so just um, briefly to kind of go over, I've said most of these things, but the behavioral health care manager does the systematic initial and follow-up assessments, tracks treatment response, provides support, and um, kind of light um, interventions like um, motivational interviewing, behavioral activation, um, and reviews the challenging patients with a psychiatric consultant weekly. 
Um, and as necessary, we had a case last week that a patient came in with, um, uh, you know, discussing um, d desire to harm themselves, et cetera. I got a call. I was doing the, the, um, I was doing the, 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 the case reviews for this particular clinic. I got a call. We talked about it um, and dealt with it in that moment. And um, the care manager is licensed and has behavioral health experience. The psychiatric consultant um, provides the um, support to the care managers, reviews all new patients, provides a provisional diagnosis and treatment recommendations. It's really up to the PCP to agree or disagree with that. Um, you know, reviews ongoing patient status, makes treatment adjustment recommendations, um, and really participates in trying to figure out what needs to be done, including advising um, treatment for patients who might need something more intense. The example from uh, on Friday was that um, we determined that this patient actually needed to be seen by the mobile crisis team. We made, you know, I made that call. I said, you know, that's what the patient needs. Um, and, um, and then the team went ahead and, and worked on getting that done. Um, again, available ad hoc or as needed. And, um, and, and there's been a very, um, you know, uh, you know, excellent training program that's been developed through um, the American Psychiatric Association and through the AIM Center, which trains psychiatrists um, in this model. Um, not all psychiatrists know how to do this, and I think that's really important to know, and, and you have to have some comfort um, in working in comorbid settings and have um, some experience in the model as well. Quality measurement, just to point out that in ACOs, there are two measures um, that um, are, you know, components or that are sort of addressed through the collaborative care model. Um, the um, ACO18, which is the annual depression screening and intervention, um, and, um, and then the um, depression remission measure. And there's other measures um, within um, MIPS um, and um, other accountability programs that are addressed um, through this intervention. Um, the economics of behavioral health treatment, um, again, um, some information that came out of the Millman report. Um, basically, uh, they, they were able to, um, to show through a, num through a survey of a, lots of different studies um, and lots of different data that patients with mental health and substance use cost two to three times more, and those added costs are in facility-based costs as well as outpatient and pharmacy. And that when you took those patients who, um, who had those comorbid conditions and you applied the collaborative care model, um, you found that there was a 5 to 10% reduction of healthcare expenditures. The original impact model showed a 650% return on investment, meaning that for every dollar spent, $6.50 was um, returned to the practice um, over you know, several months. Um, and I think, you know, you, you know, people go, yeah, right, that we'll never see that. But in reality, you do see something. And especially when you're at risk, that num that becomes real numbers when you're dealing with the population um, and you're addressing um, a large number of people with high um, health care costs. Um, they, they determined um, through this analysis that the potential annual savings for in the nation would be 26 to 48 billion dollars. Um, and also felt that this was a good um, opportunity in terms of, of creating um, some, some value for psychiatry um, and for mental health folks um, in general um, in terms of working within these settings, that there may be opportunities when in a risk-based um, environment for there to be some gain sharing. Um, I mentioned that CMS is paying for this. Um, in January of 2017, they started to pay for collaborative care, and um, and and um, and this was a, a paper that was in the New England Journal, which really talked about um, Medicare's decision to move forward with this. Um, and in 2018, um, these temporary G codes will um, become um, uh, CPT codes, so permanent codes. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how those work. Oops. Great. So the components that are required for this, and I think, um, I don't know, uh, we'll talk during the discussion, um, people can kind of share with me. Um, 
is that it's interesting when 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 I've talked to folks um, out in the community, there have been a lot of different ways that people think that they can deliver this intervention or take advantage of this um, reimbursement strategy. But there's but they're pretty specific if you look at the physician fee schedule um, in terms of what the intent is and um, the components that need to be there. And you need to have the behavioral health care manager. And it's really, again, this is all within the primary care clinic. Um, and it's billed under the primary care physician. And so the idea is that the care manager really works for the primary care doc um, and is part of that practice. So there's a behavioral health care manager. It can be delivered on site or remotely as long as the care manager um, can is able to visit the practice. Um, and so it can't be delivered by a call center. Um, you need to have a psychiatric consultant, and um, and that needs to be a, a contract. There needs to be evidence that you're in fact using the psychiatric consultant to provide consultation, not direct care. Not to say that this is this is not mutually exclusive of direct care, but in terms of developing, providing all of this, it needs to be um, in this in this type of way. And you need to use a registry so that you can assure that you're addressing um, patient needs and the population needs and that you're responding to symptoms and making changes. And on the basis of that, um, you can take advantage of um, the reimbursement codes. So what are the codes and how do they work? Um, they're time-based bundled codes. Um, they capture, and this is really important because um, they capture both direct and indirect care provided by the care manager and the psychiatrist. And that's important because there's so much time spent in looking at the um, in looking at the, um, the the medical chart and being able to um, maybe discuss the case with um, others in the practice, um, other care management staff that may be doing medical care management, um, really being able to track down that kind of information that's really critical in terms of putting the story together and talking to the psychiatrist. Um, and then it's billed by the PCP. And there are three codes, and actually there's a fourth code, which I'll mention. Um, but the three main codes are the soon to be the 99492. Um, the, can you all hear me? I hope so. Okay. Um, yeah, we can, we, can, we can hear you, Carol. Yeah, sorry. I the 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 landline that doesn't exist is actually ringing because I don't even realize we have one. Um, never mind. Um, so there are um, there's the three codes, and they 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 are um, sort of um, meant to do a, to do a few things. In the first month, there's an initiation is the initiation month, and it's seventy minutes, um, and then if if you can, if you need subsequent time, um, I mean, you need additional time of 30 minutes, you can build the, the 99494 code. Um, in the second month and, and thereafter, you use the 99493 code, which is 60 minutes. And again, you can add these 30 minute um, bits to that. And, and that's important because um, what happens is in the first month, you can spend between two and three hours providing this care. Um, when you think of all of the measurement that you have to do, the intake from the care manager, the time in the case review, et cetera, the follow-up with the patient, the follow-up with the PCP, that really can add up in terms of time. And then over time, um, the, um, amount of, the amount of time that's being spent by the team um, diminishes. And on average, patients are in the model, in the program for about six months. Um, the last code that you'll see is the 99484 code. It's called, it's the Behavioral Health Integration Code. Um, and what it is is case management and validated rating scales. Um, that can be, um, it's about, a, it's 20 minutes. And, um, you know, CMS um, established this code for those practices that really didn't have the ability to put, put all of the pieces in place, but wanted to be able to um, to offer something to their patients. And it's also a really great way at the end of sort of formal collaborative care to be able to provide maintenance treatment to patients who are not spending, needing 60 minutes of care a month. Um, the differences with behavioral health and care integration, so just kind of doing the 20 minute um, intervention, is that there really has been no, um, no evidence base behind it to show that that kind of um, intervention alone um, really leads to the outcomes um, that, um, that we've seen in collaborative care. 
So I'm actually ahead of schedule, believe it or not. Um, and I think at that point, that's my my last slide. And at this point, I'm I'm happy to take questions and we can discuss um, the presentation. Thank you so much, Carol. And um, I don't know where you're originally from, but um, you you uh, are quick like a New Yorker, and you got through um, a lot of very um, substantive slides. And I think um, it was a fabulous presentation. So. Um, there are uh, not yet any questions in the chat box, but um, I have a little uh, question. Uh, yes, folks are opened up, yeah, and I hear really some really folks fun. have a question. So, if you could introduce yourself and, and the organization you're with, and um, I'm sure Carol will be um, very willing to answer any questions. I told her. Huh? I told her that she's in Quebec. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, you can uh, maybe raise your virtual hand and we'll unmute you because we just tried unmuting everybody and that <laughs> went a little badly. So if you have any questions, you can a little raise your hand and then we'll let you ask your question. Um, as folks are doing that, I do have a question from the, um, uh, the chat box. Um, Carol, can you, so this um, collaborative care model is going to um, begin to be paid for um, through Medicare in 2018. Can you talk about um, barriers that might be faced uh, to broader adoption, you know, through Medicaid or the commercial market? And even within um, Medicare, um, any thoughts that you might have about adoption of the model, um, you know, which will start getting resourced um, in 2018. So so it, it actually has been paid for this year in 2017. Ah, okay, sorry, I misspoke. Well, no, just to clarify so people know, um, um, so CMS has paid for it this year and then those G codes, those temporary codes um, become permanent CPT codes starting in 2018. We understand gotcha that um that even now and for the last several months there have been some commercial payers who have been paying for it including Aetna some of the Blue Cross plans the regional plans as well as um, some of the Cigna plans have been paying for it um, there I don't know of others um, Medicaid um, you know is obviously a, a state by state issue um, and it is paying for uh, paying for collaborative care on those codes in Washington State and I believe in New York State as well um, but that's been a really interesting question because clearly these are patients both you know all the way through the sort of um, from the pediatric patient on up to the geriatric patient who really could benefit um, from this. So um, there's been a fair amount of advocacy and effort um, being spent to try to get um, Medicaid to pay for it. Um, you know, what are the barriers? I think that this year the, there's been, there was a fair amount of, um, uh, you know, drum banging by CMS to say, please, please, please go out and, you know, uh, submit um, bills for this. And I'll, I'll tell you that that part of it is um, the barriers because um, in the work that we've been doing at Mindula, we've experienced this. Part of this is that um, most billing systems um, are not really set up to do this kind of bundled um, code. And while a lot of them have been doing the, um, the CCM codes, um, for whatever reason, this is somewhat different um, uh, in terms of the requirements. Um, I think the other piece, just on a really technical level, is you know making sure that, well, that registry is something that the behavioral health care team can um, can run and often a lot of that work gets done kind of off offline not necessarily included in the EMR um, that there needs to be enough documentation so that the uh, billing folks feel like they've got what they need to meet the um, requirements of the code so there's clearly some backroom stuff that needs to be done um, the the other thing I think and this has been I think the really the, the biggest barrier is that this is not simple to implement um, and I think that um, there have been 
Um, you know, if you look at the places that have implemented this, they've often done it um, with help from um, a grant, um, with, you know, either a federal grant or, you know, CMMI grants, um, other sort of community-based things. Um, so it's it's a somewhat expensive, um, it's an undertaking, um, having, you know, putting together the kind of pieces. The AIM Center has a lot of resources to help people do it. They've got a, a registry template that they use, which is um, kind of a souped up um, Excel spreadsheet, but they're doing other work um, that kind of can help people with this. And um, the training programs for both primary care and for uh, psychiatry, I think, is also a big help. Um, this is, uh, you know, obviously um, kind of the work that we've been doing, and there are other vendors out there who are trying to figure out ways to automate this or to create, you know, to provide the infrastructure so folks don't have to do it. Um, I think in large systems, um, and there's been in things like the CPC Plus program where there's um, there's really an advantage to have, take an aggressive stance toward looking at behavioral health problems um, and the risk, um, the upside risk is, um, is generous um, as well as the downside. But um, I think in those settings, people have been more willing to um, look at how they can build this within their, uh, within their, within their centers. So, um, you know, I think it's uh, it's complicated, but I uh, but I think that um, again, where there's a will, there's a way, and there's there's lots of resources out there. Um, one of the things I just want to mention because I think that this has been coming up, uh, you know, on a on occasion, is that there are places that are um, that are put think that they're putting in collaborative care, and what they're actually doing. It's unclear whether CMS will pay for it. I I hope they won't because I don't think it's the right. Um, thing is that what they're doing is they're saying, well, my goodness, um, you know, we could have our our um, social worker, um, you know, do this, and they can get paid, you know, one hundred and forty three dollars for an hour of work, and you know, if I just go and ask for reimbursement, they're only going to make sixty dollars. Well, why don't we just have the let's put the person down the hall? Well, the reality is putting the person down the hall is not the the solution from a clinical perspective and from an outcomes perspective. Um, and I've talked to a number of um, insurance companies, um, you know, commercial payers who said, well, how in the world would you, you know, look to this? And I think, you know, again, it's it's one of education and and being aware of what the components are. Thank you. That was that was great. And um, I mean Whenever a new model gets launched, there's always this um, period of adjustment and figuring out how to, you know, change the delivery system and how to get the infrastructure in place. And you know, so I think that's that's to be expected. Um, and then other um, challenges in in um, settings where you don't have the financial support. Another question came in to say, what happens when patients are more severe than can be managed? by the collaborative care intervention? Um, and that's a great question, thank you. Um, I gave you an example um, of what happened last week in our program, um, but I think that more often what, what happens is that after that evaluation has been done by the care manager and they've talked to the psychiatrist, you find out, and this doesn't happen as commonly as you would think, but probably 10 to 15% of the time, the patient does have a newly diagnosed um, you know, bipolar disorder, let's say. Maybe not floridly psychotic, but um, clearly, um, you know, has got symptoms that would meet criteria for that. Or they may have, um, you know, very serious psychiatric problems that really, you know, many, many tries um, and um, lack of success with depression, let's say, or um, obsessive compulsive disorder, the kinds of things that, um, that may not be really great for this model. And um, the way, and again, what you do is you refer them out, um, that you've got a care manager who's going to work to identify a referral in the community, but instead of needing to refer lots of patients, there's just a few that need to be referred. Um, the rule that I use when, when in doing this work is you, you kind of have to ask your the question of what what can the primary care doc will the primary care doc feel comfortable treating with some assistance and that really helps um, the prime it helps to really determine where that bar should be um, one of the things that uh, Jurgen Unitzer who's from who really was the 
piloted and pioneered this model um, has said often, and certainly been my experience as well, is that um, with time, the, the primary care docs get smarter. Um, and I think what really happens is that with time, there's really a collaboration between the people who are providing the model um, and the in the primary care team, such that they become more comfortable using, you know, two or three antidepressants and a, you know, a mood stabilizing agent, whereas, you know, initially they would never have done that. And as long as they've got the assistance of the team, they feel more comfortable doing it. Super. Um, so Lauren, are there other questions? Um, people have raised their hands. If not, there's there's some more in the chat box. Um, no one's raised their hands yet, but did you see the one in the chat box? Did you see that? Ask that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so I'll I'll go there to the chat box. Um, so I know Carol that you mentioned a couple of measures that are in the Medicare Shared Savings Program that um, relate to behavioral health. Um, but I'm just wondering if you can speak more broadly. Um, how is the quality field doing with coming up with um, measures that really affect, you know, that really reflect um, care in this area, and would these registries that are are required um, help um, to get to better measurement? Um, well, I think the qu the the question about how is the quality um, measure world um, kind of, you know, responding to this, and um, the answer is I think that the behavioral the, the behavioral health, the measures in behavioral health are still pretty limited and are largely based on process. Um, and I think, you know, it. I don't think that we are taking advantage in the psychiatric community of the quali of quality measurement as a incentive, you know, incentivization uh, for providing good care. Um, there is, um, I, I believe that NCQA has worked on a measure that kind of gets you um, somewhere to looking at fidelity um, of the model, um, but probably right now the best um, the best measure for this is in fact the outcome measure that looks at depression remission. Um, and because that, again, I would, I think that what the model delivers is it delivers the outcome. And that while the process is really important, if you get to the outcome, um, you know, it's all those components which get you there. And so if the, if your patients who are in this model of care that, you know, um, are shown to have depression um, get the right care and their depression improves, I think that's fabulous. I do think that we do need to develop additional measures which, um, you know, can help to look at some of the issues around fidelity um, and also broaden beyond depression. Um, and I've been working with a number of folks um, in the community um, on a policy on a policy basis um, to try to expand um, to expand the measures um, the quality measures that are available um, based on the fact that there are a number of um, validated rating scales and tools out there that can be used to look at outcomes across the board not just in depression um, you know just a call out a shout out on this one and I'm glad to provide this to you guys if you um, would like to um, to share them. The Kennedy Forum had put together some really um, useful information, not only on integrated care models, but also on measurement-based care that really look at the available um, scales that can be used in this kind of a setting, and um, and also could be um, really um, used as the basis for additional quality measures. Thank you. And now um, questions are coming in fast and furiously. Um, so this is a question from Debbie Sarenson, and um, what she wanted to know is, um, uh, you know, the reality is that many primary care physicians don't have care coordinators, um, and let alone a behavioral health coordinator. So I guess one question, Carol, you know, just thinking about it from the point of care, uh, the sharp end, if you will, how can practices justify adding this individual to the team with everything that comes with that, you know, the salary and the benefits, et cetera, even if they wanted to, how could they, um, how could they justify the cost? Well, you know, I, I think it depends largely on the size of the practice. Um, and there was a, a pretty, um, 
widely known example done in Minnesota with the, the Diamond Project, where essentially there were no startup funds, but all of the insurers had agreed to pay for this model and to agree a, a, to pay a case rate. That when you looked at the fact that you actually had this many patients in your practice, um, you saw that it was probably worth making the, the short term, you know, being a little upside down because, in fact, you were going to reduce your costs and that you would get reimbursed for the care. Um, I think that's where um, where I think some of the, the folks that are out there doing this kind of work can be helpful. Um, but, you know, I I think that we do lots of things that we go at risk for. I'll just go on my soapbox. Um, and we don't think twice about it. Um, you know, it takes, there's always going to be a startup cost to doing something new and different. You know, if you, um, and maybe it's going to take a little longer than the bone densitometry um, test that you can put into your practice. Um, but I think that if you're at risk for these patients, then you're going to, you're going to need to do something. Um, if you look at the patients who um, are the, the frequent readmitters, the ones who go to the ED. I mean, all it takes is really, you know, um, eliminating three ED visits and two hospitalizations, and you probably have paid for half a year of a care manager. And the psychiatric consultant isn't that expensive if you're paying for it by the hour. So, um, you know, there's a there's a bunch of folks out there, and um, again, I'm glad to give you guys some resources um, who are both helping with this and consulting on it, um, and that can help people do it. I recognize that it's it there is an infrastructure cost, but um, but I think it's something um, that, you know, is, is worth considering. Thanks. Well, any um, resources that you can send, we'll certainly um, post them to our uh, website along with the transcript of this call. Um, another question from Karen Sanders, and um, she's wondering how a practice can find psychiatrists who are interested in affiliating with the PCP with a PCP practice to do um, collaborative care management? So um, the, um, as I said, the American Psychiatric Association has been doing this training of psychiatrists and they, um, what they, what you can do is you can reach, reach out to them and I can provide you with the information. What they'll do is they won't provide the list, but they will, they will go out to the folks. I think there've been over 1500 people trained in this. They'll go out to, you know, you can say, well, I've got a practice in Colorado and I need somebody licensed in Colorado to do this. And they'll reach out to those who've got the Colorado licensure and say, would you be interested in talking to this practice? Um, and we've, we've used that um, in order to hire folks in different states. That's probably the best way. Um, you can ask sure. your local psychiatrist, but I think that's a better way. It's better to have somebody who's trained. Thank you, that's a great um, resource. Um, Lauren, any more um, questions from your end? Um, get to the, the, those two in the chat box, right? I think. Right, and we are really very close to the hour. I think we really got one more question here for you, Carol, and then um, we can uh, uh, call it a day for the program. It's really, really a super program. Um, so can you just um, uh, talk a little bit more about what the registry does and how it might integrate into um, the uh, electronic health record for those that have an electronic health record? What's, what, why this requirement for a registry um, and, and how does it integrate with the EHR? Great. So the, the registry is there to, to really ensure that you're tracking progress. So if you think about it, you've got a patient who comes in and they they um, score positively for depression and let's say they have a PHQ-9 score of, of 22 and you're going to go ahead and you want to, you're going to start treatment. And the way that we get to outcome is we make sure that if they are not getting better that you do something. So two weeks later, they still are at a 22. You go, hmm, what do I do now? And now you've got this objective information. Um, and, and I think that's really, if on a patient by patient basis, that's really the reason is to make sure you're keeping track. And so it's a matter of, of keeping track of these, of 
what the, you know, of the patients, of their scores, of what they're getting, and so on and so forth. On the population basis, what it does is it really helps you to look at your full population. And if you've got 100 patients in your program, you can prioritize the ones that have got the higher scores and that are sort of hot and need help right now. Um, and I think that's really the, the, the reason it's really helps you do measurement-based care um, and treat to target. Um, in terms of integration into the EMR, that's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I know the AIM Center has been working to try to do things like that with um, Epic and others. Um, my sense of it is that you, the EMR doesn't need as much detail as what we need when we're actually delivering the intervention, that you need to have certain touch points. And so in the work that we've been doing, we've been integrating kind of at a limited level and not having the whole um, registry because um, it is often difficult. Um, if EMRs are in fact um, including a registry function, there's no reason why it couldn't be sort of amended to include these kinds of um, features, but um, that seems to be an onerous task for some crazy reason. Um, a little tongue in cheek there. Anyway. Thank you. Well, I think we're really um, at the top of the hour, so um, uh, please join me in thanking um, Carol for an excellent presentation and some really good questions back and forth. And um, I think we all learned a lot about the collaborative care model and um, what to look for in the year ahead. And um, thank you for your uh, presentation and for, for the work that you do, Carol. Well, thank you, and thanks for inviting me. And I'll send off some additional resources for you guys if people want them. Terrific, that'd be super. And we'll uh, post the, um, the webinar and the slides so folks can take advantage of them um, after today. Happy holidays to everyone and thanks for joining the call this afternoon.